Hello, and welcome to this edition of SSAT Mentor of the Month series. My name is Victoria Gershuni, and I have the privilege of having Dr. Michael Brunt as one of my mentors since 2011, when I did surgical education research with him as a medical student. A decade later, I'm now his current advanced GI, foregut, and MIS fellow at Washington University in St. Louis. Dr. Michael Brunt is professor of surgery and section chief of minimally invasive surgery at the Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. He is past president of SAGES and leads the SAGES Safe Cholecystectomy Task Force with the goal of reducing bile duct injuries. Dr. Brunt is immediate past president of the Central Surgical Association and current president of the Fellowship Council, which oversees advanced GI and MIS fellowship training in the US and Canada. He is on the editorial board of Annals of Surgery and has over 240 publications. His clinical and research interests are in clinical outcome studies in minimally invasive surgery, benign foregut surgery, safety and cholecystectomy, sports hernia, and surgical education. He has received multiple prizes and awards, including the Philip J. Wolfson Distinguished Clinician Award from the Association for Surgical Education, the Distingu Distinguished Clinician Award from Washington University, the Lifetime Achievement Award from Barnes Jewish Hospital, and the Distinguished Alumnus Award from Johns Hopkins University. To add to all of that, for the last 27 years, he has served as the team surgeon for the 2019 Stanley Cup champions, the St. Louis Blues. So I'd like to thank Dr. Brunt for taking his time today to speak with us. And we'll start our, our discussion by just talking a little bit more about his early career. I would love to hear how his practice evolved into what it is today, sp and specifically focus on what role mentoring has had in his life and whether or not there was a particular mentor or colleague who has played a significant role in his career development. So Dr. Brunt, without any further ado, take it away. Thank you, Victoria. And thank you so much for having me here uh, to have this discussion. Uh, I think this is a great series and I'm, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And uh, thank you for that very kind introduction. And, um, and it's great to have you back. It's always great to have one of your former students uh, who uh, really excelled uh, when you were in medical school and to have you come back after residency training and to uh, be with us in fellowship. So it's a real uh, a privilege um, and uh, makes me, is especially gratifying for me to have you back as our fellow today. So um, you ask about uh, training. So um, um, I, I trained in general surgery in the 1980s. And, and to say that it was a different era is is a pretty big understatement. It was, it was radically different. Um, it was very old school general surgery um, and uh, everything was done open. Um, and and um, the surgery in general wasn't as complex. Uh, vascular surgery was really starting to take off. Uh, transplant surgery was pretty well established, but liver transplantation was just coming on. And, and really most of the, of the of the surgery was done by true general surgeons. It was very general. A lot of uh, gallbladders and uncomplicated hernias and uh, colon surgery and breast surgery and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, patients were all admitted to the hospital preoperatively before their surgery the night before. Um, and then they had surgery and sometimes they stayed in two or three days after even an annual hernia repair. Uh, probably one of the most um, uh, significant things is that when I was in training, I didn't do a single laparoscopic case. And now that's most of what I do. And, um, and I started in, in practice in actually 1990, which was right at the outset of the laparoscopic revolution. And so um, I think I was the third person on the faculty in, um, in the Department of Surgery and General Surgery uh, that did a lap coli with Nat Soper, who did the first one here. And, um, and so, uh, but it, there was a very steep uh, learning curve. Uh, we went to the lab, we did a lot of uh, uh, skills training, if you will, or early procedures uh, in, in, the, uh, in the lab. There weren't, there weren't really the simulation models that we have now. Uh, we went and worked with the GYN surgeons to learn how to get access safely. We didn't have the safety trocars like we've got today. So that was actually one of the most nerve-wracking parts of starting laparoscopic surgery is just getting access. Uh, and it can still be uh, a part of the operation that, um, that can have really serious consequences if you're not careful. 
And then the first of everything we kind of did together, the first lap, hiatal hernia lap, inguinal lap, spleen, lap adrenal, et cetera. So I think having that sort of teamwork and collaboration was really critical to getting off the ground. And there's, there's just never been a period in surgery in our lifetimes and probably never will be again where there was such a radical and abrupt transformation um, from uh, doing everything open to doing so much uh, laparoscopically. And it re required retraining an entire generation of surgeons. And, and uh, that's a little bit of a part of the biotic injury story that we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, so um, you ask about that transition, uh, even though we started doing laparoscopic surgery, a lot of it was open. And I, I actually started at the Jewish hospital before Barnes and Jewish were merged and there were hardly any other full-time faculty and, and I get asked to do everything. I was doing breast and colon and, and uh, endocrine was an area of interest. I did that, did other GI surgery. And so um, for me, it was, um, it was really valuable to have, there was a, there was a surgeon who'd recently tired from private practice and um, he had joined the full-time faculty and he really served as an invaluable mentor uh, to me. And um, it wasn't so much in the operating room, but it, he was someone that you could talk about a case. You could go down to radiology, look at the films. All the films were on roller boards down then. So there, there was no electronic health record. So you had to actually go look at them real time. And it was just uh, invaluable to have someone for a bit of a difficult or challenging case or maybe something you hadn't seen a lot of. Um, to be able to bounce that off of that person, say, yes, I think you know, this is the right thing to do, or no, you ought to think about this, et cetera. And I, I think that's, that's something that holds uh, still today for our trainees. Um, I think I've, I've thought about this uh, a fair bit. One, uh, one of the things that Victoria and I worked on when she was a student was a fourth year student uh, skills preparation courses for surgical residency. Uh, I think, um, and I think that's really important, but um, the transition to practice, even though 80% of graduates today do some type of uh, fellowship, I still think that transition to practice is one of the, one of the biggest transitions that you'll ever face in your professional career. And I think that's when it's really critical to have uh, someone you can lean on a bit, uh, um, uh, someone more experienced in surgery that can help you in your decision-making about cases and, and, act, and come to the OR and, 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 uh, and help you on a tough case uh, when needed. And it doesn't have to always be the same person. Uh, you know, it, it may vary depending on what, what it is that, that you're doing, but um, I don't think it can be understated the importance of having that kind of a support network when you, uh, when you start your own independent practice, whether you are in an academic center or a community hospital, I don't, I don't think it matters. I think the, the principle holds regardless. Yeah, that's one of those things that I keep thinking about throughout this year. You know, as, as we march along, this transition from being the trainee to faculty, it, it's um, somewhat overwhelming. You know, it can be a stark difference being on one side of the table with um, all of the responsibility that you aren't used to, you know, when before you are on the other side of the table, just able to focus mainly on your training and know that you have that person, you know, you, there's the attending in the room who's in control and all of a sudden you're that attending. Um, I think, you know, I've noticed in my short time back here, just how collaborative all the attendings are and how you really do have that, um, co-mentoring amongst the colleagues, which is really great. You know, one of the things that I was going to ask you, which you kind of already started to answer, was what are those components that you consider to be key for that a successful transition? So in addition to having someone you can call and that mentor, you know, what do you think will set you up to hit the ground running as a young faculty member? So I think, um, I mean, first of all, um, I, would, I would just uh, say that I think this is one of the reasons that fellowship training is so critical today it is because um, uh, it gets you a concentrated experience over a year or two years. I mean, it depends on what fellowship you're doing, but some of them are one year and, and others are two years or maybe even three years for some of the advanced specialties like, uh, like uh, uh, cardiothoracic. 
Uh, but uh, to have that concentrated experience and repetitively, I, I think that is absolutely invaluable. I, the other um, advantage of fellowship is that you get to, um, at least hopefully, there should be some gradual progression towards relatively more autonomy as you progress through the fellowship year. And that's at least that's what we like to see. Now, sometimes that's difficult because uh, you're on a busy service and there are not enough residents to cover the cases. And so you, you, there's no one else to help except the other attending, you know, and it's kind of hard for us to keep quiet sometimes when we're in the operating room. So, um, but I, I think that's why fellowship is so important. I, my chief year, I operated mostly independently for about six months at, at some of the outlying hospitals. And that, that's not a model that I would ever suggest that we should go back to. Uh, but there's some value in starting to make that transition. Um, I, think, I think a part of the success starting out is to, um, you know, if you can do cases that maybe aren't quite as complicated uh, and relatively straightforward, that can be challenging. Um, and you're usually not quite as busy early on, so you can spend a little more time. And I, I would just, I would say that time and speed is not uh, one of the most important variables in the OR, especially when you're starting out. It's, it's much more important to take your time and, and to do things right and to, and to never get in a hurry. Um, and when you have an anticipated difficult case, I think it's really, it's important to, it's always best to line up your help in advance and not wait until you're in the middle of the case and you're having trouble and then you gotta call somebody. So I, that, would, that, would be the, that would be some of the best uh, advice uh, that I can, that I can uh, give you uh, starting out. I, I, one of the things that I think we don't, this kind of gets a little bit more into patient safety, but uh, one of the things that we don't do enough in the operating room is to stop and to take pause and, and even to ask our trainees, what are you thinking? You know, what are you seeing? You know, what do you see? Um, and when you're constantly moving during a dissection, and that, I think this is particularly true in no-invasive surgery when everything's done off a of scope and so much mm -hmm. of surgery is done that way now. When you're, out, when you're constantly moving, you just don't see as much. Um, I've, I've, I, I think one of, the, one of the other things for me, and this is probably a little bit more mid-career, but it helped me to, to put myself back on a learning curve. I think it helps you remember, you know, what, what it's like for your trainees a little bit. And I've done various things. I spent a lot of time and a uh, fair bit of time in the mountains uh, with uh, some very experienced mountain guides. And one of the guides uh, that I, um, I climbed with a few times always used to say when you were approaching a difficult section or pitch or, or something else where there was a little bit of increased risk just to take your time, you can't take back time. And so I think those are just some of the important take home lessons early on. Definitely. Um, I think that taking pause is so important, especially, you know, as you're saying, we move through cases so quickly. And when you're um, at the end of your training, you're often lull lulled into this idea that you, you're able to do such a great you know, quick operation without realizing so much that the person on the other side of the table is actually making it possible for it to be that quick, smooth operation. And so when, you know, one of the things that I'm curious about is when you become the person on the other side of the table, especially in a field like minimally invasive surgery, whether it's laparoscopic or robotic, when you often give up so much control that you, you know, if we were open, your hands are there, you can take over much more quickly. Like, what strategies do you have for teaching in the OR as a young faculty member who may still be on their own learning curve, but when you still want to give the junior residents or, or even senior mm -hmm. residents the opportunity to, you know, take over more and more of the case? Yeah, well, I think, first of all, when you can take somebody through a case, that's when you really know how to do it. And so that, that's an invaluable part of the experience. Um, I think it's, it's maybe a little bit like uh, some other activities, the people that are most successful in sport or playing chess, for example, you're thinking two or three moves ahead uh, of the person that you're working with. And so I kind of think anticipating a little bit and looking around the corner at what's next, where, where can they get into trouble and anticipating that. 
And, um, and honestly, sometimes it means, you know, taking over for a bit until uh, things kind of get uh, back on path, especially in a, in a, in a more difficult uh, case or when you're in a you know, potentially treacherous part of a dissection. Definitely. Um, that's very helpful. You know, I think that one thing I'm constantly trying to learn is how to increase my vocabulary of speaking and talking through uh, how to do a move. Because right now I'm still at the point where I just take an instrument, you know, I just, I'm like, I, I can't tell you, I need to just do it. And so it's trying to figure out how to convey what you want someone to do technically in words. That's a very interesting challenge. I think there's some technology that may be helping with that. I mean, you're all familiar with telestration, but uh, there may be some tools coming out that will allow you to do that a little more real time in the operating room. In the early days of laparoscopy, we had this device that was a little headset and uh, it had a little laser pointer on it and a, a little mouthpiece you put it, put in the side of your mouth. And, and every time you wanted to point, uh, you, would, you would blow on it or suck on it. And, <laughs> And you and the light would go on, and you could point on the screen where you were looking. But um, oh, wow. there were some challenges with that uh, that I won't get into. But um, you know, it was a little uncomfortable. But um, but I think you know being able to do that sometimes it's hard sometimes to really put into words exactly what you want to go and where you, where you want uh, your uh, your trainee to be. I think one one of the other things that that I um, I think too is um, and I think we have to be careful, especially in this day and age, and, and probably COVID has, has exacerbated this, is that, um, that you're not working in a silo. Uh, it, you know, it's very easy with uh, everything being electronic now for you to, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, read the radiology report and look at the films yourself and, and take at face value maybe what's, what's written in the report or uh, or maybe it's an endoscopy report or, or whatever it is, um, and not be out and interacting with your colleagues. But I, one of the things that for me, the first many years of my career that was invaluable was physically going down to radiology, talking to the, whether it's a CT radiologist, GI radiologist, whatever it is, going through the films with them. With them. You learn from them and what they're seeing. I think it helps them because they understand what your clinical concerns are and what your questions are. And we didn't used to have a system to upload outside films into the electronic record and it could be viewed anywhere, anytime. They were, they were physically present, so you had no choice but to do that. But I, I, and you don't always need to do that, but I still think that is a good practice is getting out, meeting your colleagues, talking to them about problems and outside of if you have case conferences or tumor boards or whatever. And I, I just think that it's, it's invaluable to develop that rapport, that two-way communication. And um, I feel we're very fortunate here because we have superb radiologists, but uh, they make our jobs easier because if you have, you know, accurate interpretation of the imaging, your decision-making is going to be less complicated about what you need to do surgically. So I think that's really important for young surgeons in practice to do is to, is to get out and communicate uh, with their colleagues in other departments that they, um, that they rely on, let them get to know you, um, you get to know them, and, and you'll learn a lot in the process. And I think, I think you'll be a better surgeon for it. Yeah, that's great advice. Definitely, it opens your eyes when you're able to have that conversation about what you're looking at with people who, who train in a different way so we can educate each other, which is great. Um, yeah, it's nice. Now, so I just, just to going back to a little bit more on your career, I was just wondering, is there a particular accomplishment or contribution to surgery that you are most proud of? Um, well, um, <clears throat> I guess, you know, there, there are a couple. Um, in the, in the early days, we did a lot of work around uh, milliinvasive adrenalectomy, and so published a fair number of papers around that. So uh, that was kind of <clears throat> the first uh, iteration. Um, I think one of the most significant uh, areas of work, and, and you were part of this, was uh, really focusing on, I've, I've always been interested in education, but focusing on the fourth year of medical school 
And uh, we started an internship preparation course for students going into surgery back in 2006, I think. Um, and it was one afternoon a week for seven weeks. <clears throat> I was the main faculty. We had residence training. We, I, we had students that were helping with the course. And I think that um, it was not only rewarding and fun to see, but we published several papers about that. And none of them earth shattering, but I think you know now the momentum that early work led to our school uh, implementing a fourth year capstone course for all medical students, and it became the first and and currently is still the only required course in the fourth year of medical school, and so all 120 students have to do capstone. It's a month long course, five days a week, um, and I, I think. Um, helping students prepare for that transition to residency is something that we've not paid enough attention to. Um, there's a majority of medical schools now that have courses like that, but not all. Um, and, and, and one of the important elements of that is that we put an assessment piece into it. And, and the reason I think that's important is because assessment drives learning. And, um, and we had, um, we had a, uh, a um, uh, kind of a top gun skills competition between some of the fourth year students and our surgery residents. And the fourth year students uh, finished uh, uh, on average a little bit ahead of some of the surgery residents. And it's because <laughs> they have the time to practice, they're motivated. And, um, and I remember uh, some of the feedback we got when stu one student went into GYN, um, started her residency in GYN elsewhere. She sent me a note. And she said the first week uh, she was assigned a scrub on a laparoscopic hysterectomy. She, we, we did a lot of lap skills training and, and we, we pushed them to train to meet certain proficiency targets and really develop those you know, two hand video, hand eye coordination skills. And uh, just as they were start the case, the resident got called away. So it was her and her attendant. He let her do some stuff, turned into a good portion of the case. And he said at the end, you operate like a second in the second year resident, which I thought was incredible. And that's a tribute to that person's skill, but also to having had the opportunity. And, I, and so I think the message from that is all these students need is the opportunity, they need some guidance, instruction, they need to be pushed to reach proficiency. And they can come into residency and hit the ground running from the standpoint of technical skills. And then, you know, basic suturing, knot tying and basic lap skills. And then the rest of it's learning, you know, all the other things that go on with the now that you're a physician and starting internships. So um, I, th I think that that's a little bit of a legacy here at our institution with Capstone. And I think that's one of the things I'm, I'm most proud of. That's wonderful. I mean, I, I agree and have that common uh, interest. And I think it's fantastic that you are able to give early trainees the opportunity to focus more on the important aspects of providing care to the patient and less on the technical concern of, am I doing this right? So by giving them the opportunity, as you said, ahead of time to get those technical basics under their belt, you really are freeing up their mind to, to learn more from each case and to progress at a faster rate, um, at least theoretically, which when is great. When you're having to think about how, how do I throw a tie and yeah. Um, and then you're not, you're not able to concentrate on anything else in the operation, really. You're not able to learn the, the operation and what you need to do. So just having that fundamental skill set, I think, is critical. Um, a, a quote um, that I'm fond of from the climbing community, um, Steve House is a very elite, well-known climber, uh, said, motivation is the ultimate clean energy. And, um, and I think that's really true. Uh, and we are so fortunate in surgery and medicine to work with not only some of the brightest people in the world, young people in the world, but most highly motivated and I think and committed and dedicated. And so I, they, they just, they need the opportunity, but it also takes uh, feedback, coaching and practice, you know, mm -hmm. to reach that. It doesn't just happen from doing a skills course, okay? You do, you do a boot camp course at the beginning of residency, you're doing all this other stuff. You know, you're going to be so busy starting out. You're not going to have that time to practice. So uh, best to do it fourth year medical school. You got more time than you'll ever have the rest of your life. 
and so um, that's why I think uh, I would just say take advantage of it. And if anyone's listening to this and they don't have a fourth year skills course in their medical school, I, I think it's a great opportunity for surgeons to get involved in education, to get to know students and to make a difference. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate all of your time. Um, I think you had some great pearls, especially for that transition to practice. And I um, look forward to getting to share this with everyone else out there so they can get a little bit more of your wisdom. Thank, thank you, Victoria. This has been a lot of fun uh, chatting with you. And um, I, the only last thing I will say is I'll just, um, I would be remiss if I didn't mention uh, the Sage's Safe Cholecystectomy Program. And for everybody to learn the six step program and to look at the consensus conference guideline. Um, and uh, because I think uh, together, and I, I will say that um, this, the consensus uh, meeting and effort, that's, that's, that's a multi-society collaboration and SSAT was a huge part of that. And I think uh, together uh, that we need to continue to promote safety around this common operation. And I'm convinced we can substantially reduce the number of bolic injuries that occur uh, in the US and worldwide. So just wanted to, mention that briefly. Definitely. Thank you. And thank you so much for the work that you've done for safe cholecystectomy. I know that it's a huge initiative that has will impact every hospital across the country and will hopefully save many patients from injuries. So thank you so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure talking with you.